Thank you for listening to this week's message from Go Church. We hope it encourages you today. For more information about Go Church, check us out online at letsgo.church. We hope you enjoy today's message. Now, let me ask you guys a question. Be honest with me today. How many of you have complained about something? (laughs) I've already got hands going up (laughs) in the back. In the last week, you have complained about something. Can I see a hand? Wow! We're in the middle of a great series called Stay Positive. How many of you have complained today about something? I see another hands in the back, yes. You know, some of the common ones I hear in and around Go Church, common complaints. I cannot believe Go Church only lasts an hour on Sundays. I can't, I mean, I get up, I get ready, I take my kids, and Pastor Nick only speaks for 30 minutes. That's out of control. I get mad. Other things I hear, common complaints maybe from the wives in Go Church. I hear this a lot. My husband, my husband only does the dishes six nights a week. I cannot believe it. Outraged. Real complaints. My twin boys, Ethan and Levi, who are sitting right up here in the front, good to see you. The best looking row of people right here in the front. Recently complained, and this is really going to get some of you, recently complained, Dad, our internet's too slow. <laughs> okay, if you're like me and you're like a young Gen Xer or old millennial, you're like, what? The internet's... What? We have fiber, a gig down, and a gig up. We used to have to plug into the wall to use a phone line. They don't even know what a phone line is. And then you have to dial another planet. (laughs) You remember all those sounds? Is it going to connect? Is it going to connect? Is it connect? Complaining, complaining. No, for real, maybe you have complained about some normal things. Maybe it's job. Maybe it's traffic. Maybe it's weather. Maybe your kids have been crazy. Maybe your spouse is got on your nerves a little bit in the summertime, like summertime break, we've been doing a lot of these outreach events at concerts, concerts on the green, and different kinds of events, and the parents, it's always like, it's summer break for the kids, but for the parents, it's like very, very much not a break, right? They're running them all over the place, getting tired, maybe you're ready for school to start again. Parents, can I get a little bit of amen? Amen. Love the kiddies. I want you to think about what you have complained about recently. I've been thinking about this. Sometimes you don't even know the things that you should be grateful for. You don't even realize some of the things that you should be grateful for. When I was growing up, 12 years old, I asked my Grandma May. This is a picture of my Grandma May and my cousin Cruz. This is Grandma May. You would love Grandma May, and you would love Cruz. Cruz is a ton of fun, lives in Tulsa. Grandma May, she is just so short and so cute and loves the Lord, so funny. She's always reading. So growing up, you know, they were on the farm. We'd go to see them. So when I'm about 12, I go up to Grandma May, and I say, Grandma, if you were going to pick one luxury to have in your house, what would you pick? And she kind of starts thinking about it. Now, in my 12-year-old brain, now maybe in our modern-day brain, what would, you, what would you pick? Maybe you'd be thinking like, well, it's time to go hot tub. Yes. Yes. Bigger hot tub. My wife is like, yes, she's amening me on that one. Maybe you would think we're going to go sauna. We're going to go very European. We're going to go sauna. Maybe you would go upgrade this, upgrade the appliance. I mean, most definitely on the niche should be like the newest, biggest OLED TV. Come on, men in the house. The newest, biggest. It can never be too big, really, with TVs. So I'm asking her this question. This is what I'm expecting. And she's giving it a thoughtful think. And then she goes, you know, son, I would pick running water. (laughs) She was not joking. I was like, I didn't even know that was on the list. (laughs) And then she began to tell me, she's like, I remember when we had to go outside of the house with a bucket to the pump and pump Pump, pump. Do you know how much water weighs? One gallon of water is like 8.3 pounds. Out and in, out and in. And grandma is small. Sometimes we don't even know 
or think about the things that should be on the list. I mean, when was the last time you thanked God for running water in your house? Electricity, a safe place to sleep, friends that you might have in your life, family you might have in your life, all except that crazy uncle. Maybe you've given God thanks for all kinds of things, but maybe through life we have missed out on a little bit of joy and peace because we have gone maybe even unknowingly into this realm where we don't give God near the things that we should. Maybe because it's been hijacked. You know, maybe our gratitude, our thankfulness has been hijacked by things like self-reliance, ego, even our earthly culture. It's like, it's all about you, you can do it, it's all for you, you're good, you, 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 all these things. Maybe we have allowed some peace and some joy to be hijacked instead of being people that can stand in awe of God's kingdom and God's kindness and always be fast to find things to be thankful for. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for this. Thank you, God, for that person. Thank you, God, for doing this in my life. Thank you as I go and get running water that's already chilled out of my fridge. Thank you, God, for your blessings. I want us to get into this today and grow in gratitude. We're going to bring this series, Stay Positive, to a powerful conclusion. So let's do this. Grab your communication card, flip it over, right across the top. One big thing, write this down. Gratitude makes what I have enough. Write this down. Gratitude makes what I have enough. I want you to think about the things you have complained about over the last week or two, maybe the things that you've heard in and around your life, which have been complaints, and I want us to see the power of gratitude and then the epic lack of it. Jesus notices this. This is Luke chapter 17. Check it out. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. He was going into a village. Ten men. Everyone say ten men. men. Everyone say ten men. Ten men men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Something that is kind of hard for us to understand is how dramatic the condition the medical condition of leprosy was back in the day. We get a little taste of it if you've ever unfortunately had COVID or knew somebody that did, you know, isolation, separate yourself. How many of you have ever spent enough time in your bedroom you thought you were going to go crazy? I've done that. I'm like, I'm about to lose it. I've been trapped in this room for so long. People who contracted leprosy back in the day, it was not curable. Your life, if you were diagnosed with leprosy, it doesn't matter if you were rich or poor, You had to leave all that you knew. Think about it. If you contracted leprosy, which was a disease, is a disease that will eat away your body parts. Students in the house, I'm talking about some of the most painful sores and oozing, painful disease. You will start losing fingers and toes, pieces of your face, painful. Not only that, they had to leave their family. They couldn't be around their family because they could pass it on just through touch. That's why they were yelling from a distance. They didn't come right up on Jesus. That was against the rules. If you contracted leprosy, you had to leave that business. Think about the business you're in now. Maybe one that you took 10, 15, 20 years to build, had to leave. Family, leave. Never hug them again in your life. Imagine never being able to hug or kiss your spouse, your kids, any family member again for the rest of your life. You couldn't be within 20, 30, 40 feet of them the rest of your life. So that's why they were together. These 10 men were doing life with the only human beings they could do life with, people in similar condition. So this diagnosis of leprosy was a life-changing, wrecking diagnosis. Maybe like a COVID that would never go away, only worse. So they yell out to Jesus, can you do something for us? Can you help us? And then look what Jesus does. When he saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priests. 
And as they went, I think this is very interesting, they were cleansed. Just a little side note, a little footnote. As they went, they were cleansed. Obviously, they weren't cleansed instantaneously. I kind of imagine them as they begin to walk and talk and think. They're looking at each other like, wait a minute. Uh, your hand is back. <laughs> You're, do I have, a, I have a nose? I mean, imagine that walk. Like as they're walking and obeying what Jesus told them to do, as they were going, they were being healed. Just a little side note, sometimes when Jesus wants to do a miraculous thing in your life, it isn't just, boop, done. There's a process that he wants us to walk out. Step by step by step as we're doing and living the way that Jesus wants us to live, healing starts to happen. If you give up in the beginning, well, it's not all perfect now. I give up, it didn't work. I'm still a person who has leprosy spiritually. Walk it out, baby. So they're walking it out. They're going to be cleansed. Look at verse 15. One of them, when he saw he was healed, he came back, praising God in a loud voice. In a loud voice. Think about all the people at the Kenny Chesney concert last night. In a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. One out of ten. Gratitude makes what I have enough. I want to give you two thoughts today that I think will help you grow in gratitude. A mind shift. I'm asking you today to not just do something. I'm asking you to consider changing the way that you see or perceive the world. That's what I'm asking you to consider. To see the world through God kingdom lenses. Look past our culture. Look past how you were raised. Maybe even look past how you're naturally wired and begin to think about life as bigger and greater and God stronger and the provider than ever before. Here's the first thought, write this down. This will help you grow in gratitude. This, this ethos, every good thing I have comes from God. Maybe you don't think like that right now. It's okay. Evaluate where do you see every good thing in your life coming from? Does it come from your hard work? your tenacity, your fabulous good looks, your network, your education. I just want you to think, where do you attribute the good things that are happening in your life? What is the source of those things? Think about this. James 1.17 says this, every good and perfect gift is from above. Everybody shout above. It's above. The good things in our life, they come from above. Now think about this group of 10 men. They didn't earn a cure for leprosy, did they? They didn't discover a medical breakthrough. It was given from above. It was something that Jesus gave to them. It was something that was supernatural. And even though it was so clear, even though it was so obvious that Jesus had healed them, how many men came back? Tell me, how many? One, 10%. Imagine if you had been healed, what would you have done? So I've been thinking about this. What percentage of gratitude am I with the Lord? What kind of gratitude percentage guy am I? Am I a 10 percenter? The good things that are happening in my life, do I give 30, 40% thanksgiving, praise, gratitude to God? Is there a special reserve select group of items? And I'm like, I did that. That one's mine. God helped me with this, but I did that. This one's mine. I get credit for that. I wrote that paper. I was published there. That's all me. One in 10. I begin to think about this. Jesus was responsible for 100% of their healing, but yet only 10% of the men came back. 
How much of all of the things that God is doing in my life am I reflecting in gratitude and thanksgiving and in praise? Let me tell you, I can do better. I started feeling a little bit guilty. Like, I need to do better at this. I don't want to be like the nine. I want to be like the one. I'm willing to come and throw myself at Jesus' feet. Thank you. I adore you. It's because of you. So I think about what God has done in my life. Man, God has given me water to drink practically, a safe place to live, more than one pair of shoes to wear, more than one vehicle to drive, finances to make my family work. I didn't make all these things happen. And then you go into the eternal things that Jesus has done for you. Come on, somebody. Did you earn forgiveness? Did you earn joy? God has given us salvation, joy, kingdom, hope, future. We serve an amazing God. Do you believe it? Go church. Let me hear you say, let's go. You're in the right church to say, let's go. We should be at a place where we are willing to look a bit foolish just because we are overcome by gratitude. You know, like when a kid gets so happy you give them that right gift on the right day, something, and they just are out of control, full of joy, so happy, running, throwing themselves up, down, in your arms. They're not like, I should have a measured response here because I'm afraid of what other people might think. Thank you, Lord. I want to become more childlike. I want to come a little more free in my thanksgiving and gratitude to God. Less reserved, less, less self-conscious, more undignified in my willingness to say, it is all about the Lord and what he has done in my life. He has blessed me. He has taken care of me. That's the first thing. Every good thing I have in life, it comes from God. Are we giving 10% when God has given 100? Second thing, write this down today. I will never let what I want Rob me of what I have. I'm just sharing with you out of my own story and struggle. This has happened to me before. Look at Philippians 4.13. Now I'm about to rock your brain. The Bible is about to blow a fuse in your brain because we're going to read a verse that maybe you've understood in a certain way your whole life, but it's been wrong. Okay? It's possible. Check this out, Philippians 4, 11. I have learned to be content. Everyone say content. I have learned to be content. Now, we know here in Go Church, we always read the Bible in context. That means what the Bible says, it needs to make sense with what's coming before it, after it, in the big picture of that chapter, that book, the Bible as a whole. So here we go. I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, Paul says. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret. Here's the secret. This is the secret sauce in the kingdom. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Here's the secret, Philippians 4.13. I can do all of this through him who gives me strength. That famous verse, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, that you see on all the mugs, you see on all the t-shirts, you see on all the posts. I can bench press 300 pounds. I can do all things. I can increase my vertical. I can do all things. I can find a better boyfriend. I can do all things. Jesus Christ. This scripture isn't about making you a superhero. This scripture is reminding you that the only way that you can be content in life when you have a lot or when you have nothing is when you find your contentment in and through Jesus Christ. Until Jesus is all you want, he will never be all you need. Do you hear that? That hole that you're trying to fill with the next thing and the next bling and the next vehicle and the next job and the next title and all that stuff. And you keep cramming all that stuff into that hole, trying to fill it. It will never be filled. That kingdom hole will never be filled in your life unless you fill it with a relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay, how many cars you got? Gratitude turns what I have 
into enough. I'm content. Does that mean I'm lazy? I mean, is it this attitude of like, well, I'm going to stop trying. I'm just going to be content. Is that what it means? I don't think so. Because I think that goes contrary to other principles that you see in Scripture, principles like stewardship. Here's my attitude. I'll make suggestions, you make decisions. It's like a Peloton instructor. (laughs) I want to be content, but never satisfied. Do you hear me? I'm going to be content, but I'm not going to stop working. I'm going to be content, but I'm not going to stop believing, trying. I want to wring out every bit of potential that God has seen to put in my life. I want to wring it dry by the time this life is over with. I want to be content, but never satisfied. Keep believing, keep working, keep trying, keep growing. But I want to do it out of contentment, not out of an attitude of it's never enough. There's a huge difference. I've been robbed before. Early on in Sydney, Sydney's our daughter. She's 18, about to be 19. Most awesome girl in the whole world. When Sydney was first born, she, medical diagnosis, medical challenges, you know, a whole host of things that make Sydney a little bit different in her life than the rest of us. And early on, it was very hard for me. Sometimes it's hard for me, but early on, especially like, kind of one through five, six, seven years of age, I would see her around other kids. Like we would go to the playground or I'll take the boys and her to the playground. And man, I just wanted her to be able to play. Like all the other kids running, doing things to twins, you know, tearing the whole thing apart. And it was harder for her and I would get mad. I would get sad. Be like, man, I just, mm, just want her to be able to hop on that swing. I tried to get her in the swing one time and she got stuck. You know, like the little swings that have like the holes for the legs? I underestimated. (laughs) I I mismeasured. (laughs) I was like, boop. (laughs) I ain't got any lotion in the minivan, anything to lube these thighs up. (laughs) Then I got smart. I was like, well, I'll put her in the swing that's designed for people who have special needs, you know? But I thought I would do it like dad style, be fun. So I like wound it up, you know? I'm like, here we go, and let it go. And she's like, wee! And she throws up everywhere. It's projectile 360 vomit. <clears throat> so there have been times, you know, when I just want her to be able to experience normal things. And in that moment, I would allow that feeling to rob me from the good things that I did have. And it was like the things I wanted so bad, it clouded my vision of the things that I really had that I could be thankful for. We just recently went to Disney, me and Becky and Sydney, went to Disney World in Florida. And let me tell you, it was hot. That's why there are so many churches in Florida. It's so hot, the devil doesn't even go down to Florida. It's too humid. He's more used to a dry heat. It's more of a, it's more of a humid, thick heat. So, like, even at Disney, you know, we're having a great time doing all the things. And, man, I'm just seeing all these kids, you know, like, running and doing and the lines, the big rides, all the stuff. And there's a part of me that wanted to go back to how I used to be, like, get frustrated, get upset, get sad. And over the last five or ten years, I've been trying to train myself and ask God to help me whenever I feel these feelings to say this out loud. God, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for my Sydney. I'm thankful for my boo. And I started thinking about the things that she can do that I didn't know she would ever be able to do when she was smaller. I started thanking God that she can read. I started thanking God that she can draw. I started thanking God that she has such amazing social skills. I started thanking God that she can walk. We didn't know if she was going to be able to walk. I started listing off all these things, that she loves Jesus, that she loves you. I mean, literally, you. Okay, all throughout the week, beginning on about Thursday, Sydney will be like, how many worship experiences are we having? Is it one or is it two? And she'll list off 10 to 15 names of people, right? 
Is Thomas going to be there? Caroline going to be there? Hannah going to be there? Julian going to be there? Dan going to be there? I mean, she just was listing up all the people because she can't wait to see you. I start thinking about these things, and it reminds me that even though it's different, I have something to be thankful for. Think about your life. How many things have you forgotten about because of the next thing that you want so bad? Maybe you want that new car so bad you have forgotten to be thankful for that car that's been with you for a little while. Maybe not as pretty as it used to be. Old girl's got a few dings, got a few issues, but you forget to be thankful for that. Maybe you want that new house so bad that you're losing sight of being thankful for the house that you're in that's keeping you safe. Maybe you want a new husband so bad <laughs> you're losing sight. Hey, look, he's already doing dishes six nights a week, all right? He'll get to seven, baby. Don't give up. Don't trade him in yet. What is it that you want so bad that you have forgotten to be thankful for what you already have? Here's the tough truth. It is really hard to be grateful and prideful at the same time. Ouch. I punched my own self in the face on that one. Paul is saying we can be content in every situation. Imagine if you could live your life like this with that balance of I'm content, but I'm still driven. I'm at peace with the amazing things that God's doing in my life. My contentment is based on my relationship with Christ, not on my ever-changing circumstances. My faith is in God who doesn't change, not in the economy, not in politics. My faith and my stability comes from a never-changing, almighty, omniscient, holy, amazing God. That's where I get my contentment. Doesn't matter if everything else changes. I know what it is to have a lot or a little. And some of you remember that. I saw some of you nodding when I said, my grandma had to go out and pump water. That's probably not very many of you, but it took you back to a place where you remembered not having very much. When was the last time you really got thankful and said, God, where would I be without you? Where would I be? Richard Foster, who I think is a great author, I recommend you buy anything written by him. Write that down in your communication card. Author Richard Foster. Write the book Celebration of Discipline. If you want to learn to grow, I recommend you buy that book. He writes this. Freedom from anxiety is characterized by three inner attitudes. If what we have, we receive as a gift. And if what we have is to be cared for by God. And if what we have is available to others, then we will possess freedom from anxiety. This is the inward reality of simplicity. Do you see how gratitude is tied to being generous? I'm not saying that you can't have a nice car, you can't have a nice house. Have 10 nice cars. Have 20 nice homes. Have all the nice things. How do you know if you have stuff or if stuff has you? How generous are you? Are you a person that says, no matter if I have 10 homes or 100, I am bringing at least 10% of everything that God brings into my life back to him. Minimum, baby. Because I know it's God who is the source. I didn't make this happen. I'm not the almighty provider. I'm the manager. God is the owner. Check your generosity. That's how you know if stuff has you or if you have stuff. If you're not generous, I'm sorry. Stuff has you more than it should. Kind of strangle you. Have that freedom. Have that liberty. Have that lightness of heart. Imagine living a life like this, full of gratitude. You see everything as a gift and a blessing. I know I get it. I mean, you might be here today, and you're thinking, Pastor Nick, power of gratitude. I've seen the articles. I've read the stuff. It's not, not important, but Jesus didn't go to grad school for me. I mean, Jesus didn't take the LSAT for me. He didn't take MCAT for me. 
He didn't work 120 hours in rotations, living at a hospital. He didn't put in all those hours for me to do this startup. I put on all those hours. I did all that work. I was the one pulling all those nighters. Yes, it's true. Jesus didn't go to grad school for you. He went to the cross for you. Let me respectfully push back on that attitude. Did you create yourself? Where did you get those skills in the first place? Where did you get this opportunity? Where did you get this time? Think about the abilities that on some level are hardwired into you. You're just gifted at certain things. Where did that come from? Did you make that happen? Did you pre-program yourself back in the day? Are you a little demigod? Or did it come from somewhere else? Someone stronger, more powerful than you could ever be, than I could ever be. Something that's happening for me is when I see these new images from the Webb telescope. Have you seen some of these? It's a new telescope that is just revealing the magnitude of the universe. I mean, millions of galaxies. Did you make yourself? Just a reminder, we are on a spinning rock in space. Okay, did you make that happen? If the earth has moved a mile this way, a mile that way, the axis a little this way, a little that, none of this is working, all right? We're donezo. Did you make that happen? Could it be that God has built into you all of this potential, opened up doors for you, has given everything he has so that you can know him, be free, be forgiven, but at the end of the day, you're trying to take credit all for yourself. Or living in a way that says, well, that's not really true. I'm the one, after all, who made that good score in the LSAT and got in. Where did that IQ even come from? You can't make IQ. There's no pill. <laughs> Just think about that. God has given us a chance. God has blessed us with things. And with people that sometimes we forget to give him praise for, I believe. <clears throat> when I was in high school, I was a senior. My sister Kaylee, she's two years younger than me, great sister. We were at the house for a weekend together. My mom and dad were going antiquing. That's the word for like when older people want to go find old stuff. The antiquing. They like to go antiquing with their two best friends, Larry and Sandra. And so they all four were together. They were down in Texas, and it was like up to me, you know, like keep the house under control and don't do anything stupid. Really, my sister was the more conservative, safe one. They probably left it in charge with the wrong person, but we were doing pretty good. They were gone. I get a call on a Saturday. Answer the phone. A student's in the house. The phone was attached to a wall with a cable. See the internet reference earlier. I picked up the phone, and this person was on the other line, and they said, your parents have been in an automobile accident. They were stopped on the highway to turn left across traffic, and a semi rear-ended them going 60 miles an hour. We'll call you with an update. Click. I'm like, they're dead. That's what they are. I mean, nobody survives being mowed over by a semi-truck going 60 miles an hour when you're at a standstill on the highway. So in my mind, I'm like, like, okay. I've got to get Kaylee through high school. I might have to put college on hold, stay here, get her through, figure out how to do educate. How am I going to pay for stuff? Like, what are we going to do with the house? I just start going into like, how are we going to survive mode? Like, mom and dad's gone. Like, I got to step up, I got to be, I'm starting to panic, you know, like, life's completely different now. Mom and dad both gone. And then I got a call, like an hour later, same person, calling to give an update, they're going to be okay. The semi-truck hit them and launched them into the air. I mean, it just completely crumpled the truck like an accordion. Into the air, she's like, miraculously, 
even though the front seat, this is old school bench seat, all the bolts sheared off and they all went flying in the back. Just superficial wounds. Launched them into oncoming traffic. Somehow, they're all unconscious. They don't get hit coming from the other way and it just kind of goes over and stops on the side of the road. They don't remember any of this. Let me tell you, I have never been more thankful for my mom and dad than I was in that moment. I was like, oh God, I've got the greatest mom and dad. Thank you, Jesus. They are alive. I don't have to turn into a parent when I'm like 17, 18 years old. I'm just going, oh, I'm crying, so happy. This exercise will mess with you. Think about today, you get a call. A family member has been in a terrible automobile accident. We don't think they're going to make it. Come to the hospital. How that would feel. Your child you're waiting for a test result, it comes back Monday. It's stage four again. It's the worst result that could happen. You get a call, you're no longer employed. You get a call, yeah, those three investments, gone. You're back to square one. And imagine that setting there, setting there, setting there. And then you get a call, and it says, I'm so sorry, we mixed up the test result. I'm so sorry, you're fine. Can you imagine how that would feel? It's not as bad as we thought. Your kid, your loved one, they're going to be fine. It was just superficial injuries. They're going to be fine. Imagine how that would feel. You see, sometimes you don't realize how thankful you should be until you think about losing something that is most precious to you. So today, my challenge to you is this. Would you think through your life and pick one thing that is new for you to be thankful for? A new thing that you want to attribute to God. Maybe you've never given God thanks for the professional success that you have had. Could it be that you haven't done it on your own? That he has helped you every step of the way? But you've been like the nine. You've been so busy being successful, so busy being busy, that you've never come back. So thank you. Let's pray. God, this has hit my heart today. Help us be thankful for the things that we've taken for granted for too long. The people in our life, the relationships that we have, the opportunities that we have in you, to live in a place like we do, to have material blessings as we do. But God, most importantly, to have spiritual blessings, forgiveness, restoration, transformation, a hope of heaven, future, to be redeemed, to be known, to be clean in you, to be called a son, to be called a daughter. God, help us never to become so numb and so busy being successful that we don't come back to you and say, God, thank you. This is all according to your goodness and kindness. Help me to be generous. Help me to be thankful. Help me to be undignified in my thanksgiving and praise to you. God, help us to be thankful today. One new thing to give you praise for today, God. The most important thing that we could ever be thankful for is a real relationship with Jesus Christ. We could be so thankful because Jesus came to this earth. He lived. He paid the bill of our sin and our mistakes that we could never pay. He paid it with his perfect, sinless, mistake-free life. He gave his life for you and for me on the cross. He died on the cross bearing all of our sin, all of our shame. He took it upon himself. We have so much to be thankful for. They took his dead body down and they put him into a tomb to be guarded. One day, two days, three days. On the third day, God raised him back to life. And that is the game changer that Jesus is alive and he has a plan for your life. And that's for you to know him, not just to know things about him or to attend some religious event, but to know him as leader and savior and friend and God. 
Do you know him? You can. The Bible says that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I want to give you an opportunity to pray with me right now and to pray that prayer. Pray this with me if you want to make Jesus the king of your life. Jesus, thank you for speaking to my heart. I ask that you would forgive me of every sin. I'm making you the Lord and the leader of my life. And I'm going to live for you the rest of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for listening to this week's message. To stay in the know with Go Church, be sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at letsgo.church. You can also download our app from the App Store by searching Go Church. Have a great week and God bless.